Hi everyone, welcome. Um, as Natalie's just said, uh, I'm Tamsin, this is Peter. Um, and what we're talking about tonight is, is networking and, and hopefully by the end of the evening you'll be feeling a little bit more comfortable about moving your comfort zone a little bit more to where, towards where that magic happens. You'll be feeling a little bit more comfortable about the whole networking process. Uh, now of course I was a bit mean in that even before you got in here we gave you a task, a little networking task. And I'd like to just uh, get a, an indication of hands through the, the little task I gave you as far as having that extra question there, did anyone find a connection or hear about a resource or find out any information? <coughs> Couple of nods. Excellent. That was, the, that was the point of it. And that's also actually, that highlights that whole value of networking. Um, I guess without further ado, I'll move on to the, the topics that we're covering tonight. So we're going to be talking about networking and why do it, uh, a, bit, a bit about your network and how to establish who is, it that is in it and who to, how to develop it, about how to make a good impression and also some networking tips and some strategies. Please do ask questions as we go along, we're both quite, quite happy to, to interrupt what we're talking about and, and answer those questions so don't, you don't have to save them all to the end. So what is networking? Would anyone like to shout out what they think networking is? You can do it. It's a bit like being a spider and having a web. <laughs> 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 you can feel something vibrating in the in the web. Somewhere you go and have a look. But it's interesting because there's there were spiders that are uh, that can pull other spiders into thinking that there's a fly there, and it's actually a, a spider that eats a spider. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so that's an interesting and very very sort of slightly freaky way of defining networking. Any other sort of thoughts on networking and what, how to define it? Making connections for mutual benefit? Absolutely. Uh, I couldn't have actually put it any better myself. So uh, yes, if I had a bottle of wine, I'd, I'd award you one of those, of those as well. <laughs> I've got a pre-baked one. It's interacting with others to actually exchange information and develop those professional social contacts. But as you say, it's, it's, it's all about mutual benefit it's a purposeful activity, so it's, 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 it's something that you actually do overtly. Uh, it can happen in a wide variety of settings, so it can be very, very informal or it can be very formal. It's also, it's the, the, the whole point of networking is building those mutually uh, beneficial relationships and developing those mutually mm. beneficial relationships. So it's, um, it really is incredibly uh, important. Um, in fact, I've read somewhere that it's a new critical competency for the changing world, that networking is going to be more and more important uh, with the whole sort of advent of AI and those sorts of th things. Networking is something that you're actually going to be able to, to utilise to develop yourself and develop your contacts and, and succeed. Uh, so why network? Well, yeah, promoting your ban brand and actually building on your reputation, helping you to access information that allows you to generate better ideas and also lets you communicate those better ideas to others. It helps you widen your whole circle of influence, uh, but also it allows others to influence you and you can spark off that uh, being influenced. And it also enables you to demonstrate how you can be of value. And that could be a value to that person or to their organisation. It could be of value to the community. So, so networking sort of works on a, a variety of different levels. There's also research that, that shows that those who network uh, uh, are more likely to get promoted, are more likely to have higher salaries, and also have better job satisfaction. So, it's, so it wins on every level, the, the whole networking process. Uh, I'm a bit of a cheer bunny for networking. I, have got every job that I've ever got, I have got through networking. Yeah, I've had to put in applications, but I've always, there's always been a networking component. Uh, so if I seem a little bit of an evangelist, it is because I am. Uh, uh, one thing that's really important in the whole networking process too, is to think, remember that you're not just networking with the person that you're talking to, 
but the person that they talk to, in fact, every single person that they know. So it's really important. And now I'm going to hand over to Peter, who's going to talk about uh, preparation and, and those sorts of activities. So before I sort of talk about the preparation, um, we actually network and we don't realise we're networking. So some of us have this connotation that networking is using people, so using contacts to get something from them. But we just need to think about networking as um, you said before, it's mutually beneficial and we can do it when we don't realise we're doing it. So if you wanted to go to a dentist, most of us don't just randomly choose a stranger to work on our teeth pain, both <laughs> financially and physically, um, you ask for a recommendation and that's networking, that's using your contacts. But it's not in an active way and what I'm just going to talk about is actually actively networking. So with actively networking you need to actually think about your personal style and what type of networking suits you personally and then you can also identify what you want to achieve. So in that case, it was sort of like identifying a dentist. Um, but you think about what you want to achieve and you might even have a systematic plan. Think about sort of whether it's actually return on investment even. So if you're trying to decide whether to attend a particular event, like one of our careers events, <laughs> thinking about the return on investment. And then researching as well. And then also being organised. Some people even love doing Excel spreadsheets and working out systematically. And I'm sure there's some mathematical equation that some people might use. But active networking, which most of us don't do, but planning is a good idea. But personality and knowing what your personality is, is really important. So the cartoon, I could be home on the internet right now. <laughs> There's a few of us who will be thinking that way. The introvert in the room is giving this, that's me. Um, so are you an extrovert, introvert? Are you socially awkward? Are you shy? Are you outgoing? Knowing that about yourself will really help you when it comes to sort of thinking about what sort of events work best for you. Are larger events um, really good for you? Or would you be better with a smaller, more intimate event? Would you be better off one-to-one? -one? Would you better off, if you like to play golf or tennis, is that a better way for you to network? A lot of networking is done in the bar or the cafe. Time of day as well, think about your energy levels. For some of us, the thought of going to a networking evening event um, is not such a pleasant thought. So maybe you'd be better off meeting someone for coffee or for breakfast or having morning events or lunchtime sort of networking. So think about when your energy levels are at their best. And it can vary. So you might just have had a really bad day. Perhaps it's better not to go to that event than to go when you're feeling exhausted. You won't promote your brand very well. Then there's does the event fit into your schedule? So once again, it's that evening, um, you might have commitments in the morning, you might have commitments at night. So you might have to sort of think about that time of day thing in that respect as well. And then what platform best suits you? So that person who could be at home on the internet, maybe their best platform is online rather than in person. So in person, online. So think about the platform that best for you. And it's usually a mix. So you've thought about your personal style and what suits you best. So then you can also think about your purpose. Purpose is particularly useful when it comes to the online side of things. So this is all sounding very strategic at the moment. That your purpose helps you identify where and how you'll network. It also helps you work out if something is worth the investment. Um, but these are some ideas here about what your purpose might be. So it could be a new job, it could be getting a contact, it could be information. So think about the purpose of your networking. And also just remember though that it is about relationships. So networking, mutually beneficial relationships. So I am talking a lot about strategy and analysing so it makes it seem cold and impersonal. But just remember that relationships part and the dentist. <laughs> So then, it's actually categorising your contacts, thinking about who you know. So we have an inner circle, 
innermost circle. So that's our friend, friends and our family. And then we've got an inner circle, which is the people that we work with. There's also an outer circle. So it might be friends of friends or people that we've sort of met occasionally, very briefly. And then we have sort of like prospects. So people we've heard of that we would really like to meet for whatever reason. Then you've got the level of connectedness. So there are people who are called superconductors or super connectors. So they seem to know everyone. And I'm sure we all, Sally is smiling, I'm sure we all know people who are super connectors and it's how on earth do you know all these people? Think about sort of, you know, do they help a lot of people as well? So how connected are they? Do they help people? Are they super connectors? And then when you go back to what I was saying before and you think about your purpose, different people will be helpful in different areas. So it's about relevance. So you think about your purpose. Okay, so how relevant is that particular purpose, person for this purpose? So always think about relevance. Different people, different purpose. Sorry about all the words, it's all, we couldn't figure out how to make that shorter. Um, <laughs> and you will be getting these slides, by the way. Um, so you've got your inner circle, so that's friends, family, colleagues. It's actually really easy to start with them. And I would suggest you do that. So start with sort of like the easy first. Tap into your sort of like networks, your inner circle networks. It might be that they can introduce you to someone. They can introduce you to that sort of like outer circle and to the prospects, especially if they're the super connectors. So we've got that easy way of doing it. Tamsin's now going to talk more about the hard way. <laughs> oh, not so hard. <laughs> hard do you? Hard do you? Slightly harder. Uh, I've got a question for you. Do you think that more opportunities come from those close to you or more removed from you. So a show of hands, who thinks that more opportunities will come from those who are close to us? So a few there. Who, who, who more removed? I think they know it was a trick question. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, the, the, the majority of you are right there. Um, the, those who have weak ties, those who are more removed from you, are actually likely to be more useful for you uh, in this, this, this. And part of the reason for that is that the strong ties that you have with, say, a partner or, or, or with a family member, often you're going to know the same people. And so that's why what those weak ties can be much more effective. Now, we, we, we sort of Thinking about that, mapping your network with both your stronger ties and also your weaker ties uh, is really useful. So, so as Peter said just before, start actually with those immediate contacts. Start with those who are, um, who are closest to you. You could, um, you could use your phone contact list. Uh, just to sort of getting out your cell phone and running through that, that's probably the majority of those, um, of those strong ties are going to be in there. There'll be some weak ties as well, but a lot of strong ties will be in there. Then think, think, think further on, out on from that. Think of those who are more, m still related to, but not really close to you. So it could be church groups, it could be sporting groups, it could be uh, uh, professional associations, it could be extracurricular activities that you go to, the, um, the reading group. So that's, but those, some of those might be strong ties as well, I've heard, from what I've heard about reading groups. <laughs> uh, uh, and each, each contact from those, those that sort of immediate network and then the further network can then lead, lead to further contacts. Now, I don't know if you're into mind mapping, one way to actually map your networks is to use something like a mind map where at the core of the mind map you have um, uh, what you're, you're wanting and then you spring out from that. But for some people, mind maps doesn't really work for them. So you might, you might look and you might find an app that works for you that actually helps you to map these things. Or Peter mentioned spreadsheet. Some of us love spreadsheets, so, uh, and that can be a really good way of, of mapping things, things out. Uh, I had a boss who had a file of business cards, 
And so he would, when he was sort of working out his networks, he'd get his wad of related business cards and he'd spread them all over his desk. It was, um, it was, it was fascinating. I would never have known who all these people were that he met because he could, he'd be firing out twenty or thirty at a time. But that was his way of of establishing those networks. And then he might contact one of those to see if he could get further contacts. Just a tip with business cards, although we tend to not be using them so much now. But if you do get a card, um, just write where you met the person or maybe something memorable about them so that they, you know, sort of their glasses or something that they said or that they've got three children or six cats. <laughs> and then when you email them, you can make mention of their six cats. Because, and, and yes, you, that, that, that um, way of remembering them might also help you as far as uh, remembering what it was that you discussed at the time beyond that, those sorts of aspects of it as, as well. So, where to network? Um, once you've ma mapped those contacts, think about um, choosing where to network. And remember what Peter said about your purpose, because uh, it might, your purpose might actually influence where you choose to network quite a lot. So I'm going to start off with in-person and some tips for success in that. So, in-person, a lot of people think that networking is just events. It's sessions like this. And yes, it can be. It can be formal networking events, but it can also be smaller meetings. It can be professional interactions of a variety of sorts, or it can be one-on-one -on -one meetings. So thinking about networking not as just going and doing things in big groups, but, but of all those sort of interactions that you might have with, with someone is, is important. Important that right at the start of the, um, the networking process that you do a little bit of prep, that you actually prepare for the interaction. This is not always going to be possible, but really good if you can actually research the industry that they're in, if you can research uh, a little bit more about what, they, what their industry does, because that was, is also going to help you as far as those conversations go. If you dry up, you can think, oh, now I remember that the, the sector is having this issue, so I could throw in a really good conversational gambit around that. Uh, think about the event purpose, because if you research that event purpose, you're more likely to think of, be able to recognise the sorts of people who might be at that event, and therefore that can as assist you in your preparation. And think about questions that you might like to ask. Again, the, the whole researching of the event can help you build up those questions because sometimes, I'm sure we all have had this, it's really hard when you put on the spot and there's that gap in the conversation to actually think of those questions. If you've got some pre-baked ones, then you can just sort of haul those out of your, um, your kite and think, ah, yes, this is a good time to ask, uh, ask that question. During the, um, during the networking, really important that you think about the how, the process, and I'm going to talk quite a lot about, a bit more about that. But, but body language is a part of it, being nice. Asking questions, but not asking questions just for your satisfaction. Asking questions so you know how you can assist them. And again, when we talked about things being mutually beneficial, it being a two-way process, that's, really do keep that in mind. How can you benefit them? How can they benefit you? And don't forget, in, the, in, the pers in person, afterwards, how are you going to follow up? How are you going to carry that network on? Because really, a network conversation that's not carried on uh, is an opportunity missed. So it's really, really important to think how you're going to further that network. And that could be by an email. It could be by a LinkedIn connection. You may have got on so, so well and, and you might have a business card that you might have exchanged business cards and you, you might uh, organise to, um, to meet up for coffee. Uh, so, so really do think about how you're going to, uh, uh, to, to do that as well. Now one thing that um, uh, people often worry about during the networking process is what am I going to say? How am I going to join into a networking um, interaction? Again, doing that homework, seeing who the key people are who might be attending that event. 
Again, it's not always possible, but in this, this highly networked in the IT sort of way, uh, world, it's often possible to get a lot of information about an event. Uh, you may also be able to e-stalk them, go through something like LinkedIn, so getting a sense of what interests them may make that easier to join in uh, during that networking activity. Don't forget that, again, I'm, I'm, I'm harping on about this, I know, that the whole mutually beneficial thing means that you actually listen to them rather than talking at them. And um, it's, a, it's a bit of a risk during, during networking, particularly if you're nervous. Sometimes people get sort of the, the verbal diarrhea and they just sort of talk at people. So but it's taking a big, dip, big deep breath and trying to draw that other person out, trying to get as much information out of that person as possible. Uh, it, it enables that connection, it enables that, um, that ability to, uh, to, to work with them on a, a variety of different levels. Uh, be inclusive. Don't, um, don't hog that person to yourself. Uh, so don't monopolise uh, uh, individuals. Bring other people into the conversation. And that's also part of the whole uh, giving back to the whole network, is that if there's someone who obviously wants to join the conversation, you, you, if you bring them in, not only are you sort of helping, helping the, the, the whole networking uh, thing go on, but you're actually also exhibiting to the other people in that group that you actually have good social skills, that you care about, the, um, uh, about others. So it, it reflects well on you. So it can, it can work on a variety of different levels. Uh, as I said before, Make sure that you think about things that you might need to use as far as small talk. Sometimes in a networking opportunity, you may have a lot of stuff that you're going to talk about because of the nature of the opportunity. Uh, professional associations that, that are, or an ac academic type networking opportunity could be that. But you don't know um, uh, whether that's going to be the case. So thinking about things that you might say, uh, and I like the, this, this quote here, as I drive to a party, I try to come up with two or three things to talk about in case the conversation runs dry. So it's something, that, something again, that you can do beforehand. Uh, but that actually, that other quote's really important too. You don't have to, just, the golden rule is that you don't have to be brilliant, just nice. So, so during that networking um, uh, interaction, being nice to people will go a long way. I've got a question for you all. So that slide says, how do I join in? So you're at a networking event, so like tonight, you're in a group. How do you leave the group? What strategies do you have? <laughs> do you have sort of like a phrase that you might say, oh, I just got to go and talk to Tamsin, or any... I'll grab another drink. Yeah, another yeah. Drink. getting another drink is quite a common one. <laughs> yeah. What else? Is that the most... That's the one, isn't it? <laughs> I, I think there's another one. Yeah, there is another one. Snack. Yeah, another snack. A another snack. Um, go to the loo. <laughs> Got to go to the bathroom. Uh, there is that, oh, I've just seen, seen someone right over the other side of the room that I need to see. <laughs> <laughs> so has anyone got anything other than those ones? Interesting. Now, we're all going to be key, um, sort of keyed up for that, aren't we? So next time we're in a grove. Oh, really? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, uh, really important when you get in that group uh, situation to actually to perform your best, uh, to convey the best messages. Uh, and um, research says that more than 70% of people's first impressions of you is based on what they see. So I've got some images here. So if you look at these images, thinking about what they convey, the, 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 the gentleman on the left here, what, what sort of con what messages is that, that first impression conveying to you? Professionalism. Professionalism, yeah. Confident? Anything else? Happy. Happy? <laughs> yeah, how, about the, um, how about the one on the right? More laid back. More laid back? So before you made a judgement as to whether they were going to deliver on a project or not, you can't tell, you 
think perhaps by the professional dress they're more likely to be reliable and be on time, on budget and all the other little clues that go with professionality. It and the other guy could be, the other dresser could be equally the same but doesn't give that perception. Absolutely. So so it, it is it is important what you convey, how how you how you present yourself to the world in a whole variety of, of different ways. But doesn't that compare to the environment? Because if you walk into a room with a suit and no one else is wearing a suit and then everyone will be doing the suit, you might be perceived as being uptight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Good point. Well, the ice house, you know, the, um, the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The accounting department as opposed to the marketing department. <laughs> 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 so... Again, if you were going to a particular networking event, might you think about what your purpose was? Might you think about the other people at the event? And might you think about how they might be dressed before you go to that particular event? So again, it's about thinking about what's relevant, what's applicable. Now, I love the fact that some... Now, this is the, um, the University of Manchester. <laughs> They have actually created a, uh, a formula for the perfect handshake. <coughs> and I had to print this out because there's no way I'd remember it. So it involves eye contact, verbal greeting, what they call a Duchenne smile. I'd never heard of that until recently <laughs> either, which is a genuine smile, not a fake one. <laughs> the, the fourth one is a full grip. A dry hand, <laughs> a firm handshake, the position of the hand equal between two parties, strength, medium vigour, so not too crunchy, not too soft, uh, temperature, texture of the hand, uh, and then the duration. And would anyone like to guess what the duration should be from, um, from this formula? Two to three seconds. Two to three seconds. Yeah, you're dead right there. So. One is brief, too long, and, and, and five is too long. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so I, I do love the fact that um, uh, that an educational institution has, has worked that that um, that out for us. <laughs> but it is actually um, it is worth thinking about because again, uh, what you wear, what you wear, but also the way that you um that you actually you handle that first interaction. One thing that some students uh, ask of me is that what if a handshake is not appropriate in their culture? And that, that's an important thing too. So a perfect handshake for them would be no handshake. Uh, and the way to, that I would recommend, if that's the, um, uh, the case, is just to, to lean forward and say, um, sorry, it's not appropriate for me to handshake. And I've never seen anyone be offended by that. I've had that happen to me a number of times and I've never been offended by it either. So, so it's, um, it's perfectly okay to do that if it's not appropriate. Next, our good old friend, body language. So it's not just about the handshake. Um, think about how your, your body conveys and is it conveying what you want it to convey? Uh, and that can be your body movements, um, uh, your face, your arms. And <laughs> uh, it can be your voice, your tone, your modulation, the pauses that you do. Uh, interestingly, only 7% of what you convey in an interaction is actually the spoken word. Uh, and yes, I, I went back to the, the uh, chap who did the research on this, and it is an academically blind refereed ra di ra di ra thing. So it, it, there's have, it has actually been studies on this. Openness. Now, now looking at these photos, <coughs> who seems to be networking? Is it the photo on the left or the photo on the right? Uh, which... Which, which, which one would you be more likely to, um, to want to join? The alcoholic group. <laughs> the alcoholic group? <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, so so that, that, that's really important. On a the alcohol? <laughs> the <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Only, all because I got a glass of wine before, I don't know. I <laughs> haven't touched it, I'm not touching it till afterwards. I had to think about the nerves. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, you'll also see that here, 
just the way that she's standing with her, um, with her hands like that, it's, it really doesn't convey that she's wanting to be talked to. Whereas, apart from the alcohol here, th they, they're actually they're looking quite open. The, the, the position of their bodies, the position of their arms, is actually welcome people, peop welcoming people to approach. So you think if you were in that particular situation and you were standing there like that, I don't think that most people would feel quite so welcome, quite so like coming up and talking to you in that situation. So when you first go into our rooms, scan the groups. Um, can you face me for a minute, Tamsin? Yep. So if Tamsin and I sort of like talk, stand in front on like this and sort of like seem intense in conversation, you wouldn't go into that group. But if we're kind of sort of, you know, still talking, yep. but we're more open like this, that's the group that you could join. And we would be very inclusive. We'd be inclusive anyway. But. Well, yeah. But. <laughs> but yeah, so that can also, it can, it can be a, um, uh, an indicator to people that you're welcoming other people coming along. Now, th this, is, this is an interesting one, and I'm going to get, um, get you to... to, to to, to, to sort of come uh, and, and personal space <laughs> can be a really, really major problem for some people. <laughs> you because were saying? I don't like people getting too close to me. And so. That would be too far. That w but that would be too far. So think about when you're approaching people, think about their personal space, think about how comfortable they're going to be. One of the tricky things is that peop different people have really different personal spaces. And I was at a networking opportunity a couple of, well, a few weeks ago, and I realised that, yeah, I was, I was going like this, because <laughs> this person was getting closer and closer, and, um, and then I got backed up against someone, I thought, <laughs> okay, I'm stuck. Um, uh, so, uh, so, but it can actually, it, it, it started to distract me. It started to sort of really throw me. So, uh, so that can be something that will um, can muck you up a bit. It's very much, it's an individual thing, but it's also very much a cultural thing as well. So different cultures, different <coughs> distances. Yep. So then if you get into a situation like that, if someone is getting too close, what are the tips of, you know, apart from keep walking? <laughs> <laughs> what else can you do? I actually, I have turned side on to someone uh, and carried on talking to them but turn side on to them. So, uh, and so, so how does that work? So, so they would sort of, get, I was doing this, mm -hmm. and then I went like that. Okay, so yeah, Because you, you can't, you can't really, um, you can't <coughs> re they can't really move it in the, any closer. It would be a bit weird if, <laughs> if you... <laughs> <laughs> True. Would we dance? Shall we dance? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. So, uh, so yeah, so think about the intimate space. Think about the personal space, and then think about the social space. Now, because it may, it may differ, it can be it can be tricky. But um, uh, but really do think, and look at those those cues, that body language. If that person is going back, then mm. it probably means that they're getting a little bit freaked out by how close you're getting. So think, <laughs> ah, okay, don't want to make them feel upset. I'm going to um, I'm going to adapt to this. One of the tricky things, though, is that oh. if it's really noisy then sometimes you actually, you feel that you need to, to get closer together uh, to actually uh, still be able to hear. And that's where sometimes leaning in is a better way of doing it because you're not, you're, you, 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 you may sort of be listen, more eagerly listening to them but you're not getting your whole body too close to them and it can, it can uh, be less disquieting. Uh, Eye contact, really, really important in helping you to establish connections. Because uh, people are really quite sensitive to where you look. Uh, and I, I, I think this is, this is slightly amusing, but I think it, 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 it is fair, is that business gaze <laughs> in, into, the, um, into the eyes and the forehead, uh, social gaze more the full face, uh, and intimate gaze more of the body. Uh, so, so, so think about that. It, it, can, it can be quite interesting, however, because uh, you don't want to. You don't want to. Also, don't want to stare into people's eyes. <laughs> and uh, I've been on an interview panel where the person A didn't blink, 
<laughs> and B, sort of nailed me by the end of it. I was sort of feeling as though I was like, like X-rays. Uh, so, that can, so that can be slightly freaky. But if there's too little, there, there can actually be a lack of engagement. So I think defi it's a definitely a, it's a balanced thing. Um, also consider in, in the networking that you want to, again, be inclusive. So if you're just looking at one person in a group, then you're actually kind of excluding the other people in the group. So, so think about that in, in your networking opportunities as well. They talk about eye contact also conveying presence and presence conveying power. So that's something to think about as well, is that through, um, through the, the, the eye contact, you're actually showing that you're very present in the interaction. Also can show that you're paying attention and that whole uh, thing around being uh, being connected, being uh, relating to people is terribly important. Now, next, our um, our whole building rapport thing. I think that again, this goes back to the mutual beneficial aspect of things. Uh, if you want things to be mutually beneficial, then you're actually going to have to build connections. You're going to have to engage the other person, and the way that you can do that is by building rapport. And uh, I'm harking back to things I've talked about before, but ways of building rapport is through eye can contact, is through um, openness, is through the body position, is through the, your whole body language. Uh, it's also being overt about the fact that you're interested in what they're saying. And um, I, I read this thing that I think, thought was fantastic. Be interested before being interesting. And so thinking about what you're giving to the networking uh, relationship before you think about what you're going to take from that networking relationship. So I thought that was quite a good, um, good little thing to actually remind me anyway uh, about the importance um, of listening. Uh, as well as speaking in a networking um, situation. Tamsin and I went to an event on Friday night and so we were having a, a, a nice, pleasant conversation with someone, but it was one of those ones where every so often there was a pause where you were all thinking, what on earth are we going to say next? Uh, and that came on for a while, you know, it was going on okay, and then I was, we were in one of those pauses and it was, oh, he mentioned something about lawn bowls. Oh, what club do you play bowls at? So then he sort of like said, and he said, do you play? And I said, no, but I know someone who did. And then thankfully, Tamsin's father plays bowls in Kerry Kerry. And then his eyes lit up. It was like a switch had gone on. And it was fantastic for me, because um, I could just stand back and Tamsin and him just went for it. <laughs> um, and all about Kerry Kerry and the environment and a pub came into it that Tamsin wanted to buy and it was a great conversation. Really interesting, but it was just that one comment. And, and that would have gone on for uh, probably seven or eight minutes, that yeah. conversation that came out of that single comment. So uh, it was, yeah, uh, and it was fascinating the whole place, the places we went, but also uh, how we then started to establish mutual friends and, and those sorts of things. Uh, so out of that came uh, a networking opportunity that I wasn't expecting when I went along to their, that event that night, I have to say. Now this is an area that Peter has more knowledge of. It's, it's another place to, um, uh, it's another way to, to build rapport, and that's matching and mirroring uh, the expressions of others. It, and um, uh, and I, I remember you speaking uh, at a session recently about doing a, were you at an airport or something like that, or a cafe, and you were watching a group of people and how they all started to show the same gestures and reflect the fact that they were actually really engaged with people through that. Mirroring is actually a counselling technique, so if a counsellor is trying to sort of build rapport, they will actually consciously mirror your movements. So if you're sitting there, um, so like, like in that case, they've got their hands under their chin. So a counsellor will deliberately just match your movements. And you don't realise it, but it makes you start to feel more comfortable. 
but we do it naturally. So if we're people that we feel comfortable with, if we with friends, we just do it, and it's actually fascinating to watch. Um, and so in cafes, if I'm on my own, I'll sort of like just start people watching and look at the different um, groups of people and see how many are actually doing this. Um, and just even when sort of like a group of friends are talking as well, just watching them and slowly over time, they'll start matching and mirroring. It is really fun to watch. <laughs> but if you ever go and see a counsellor, that's what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, last but definitely not least, oh yes, I've, I've heard a few goons across the room, um, one way of engaging yourself with other people is actually to remember their names. Uh, now, I should not be talking about this because I am the world's worst person as far as remembering names. I know the tools, I use the tools, I'm still completely and utterly useless. But I'll tell you about those tools. <laughs> um, because it, it really does help in that whole rapport building process. One of them, of course, is when the person says their name, is to repeat their name. And then use their name a few more times in the interaction. Hopefully that will cement it into your brain. Um, there's the, the, um, the word association aspect of things. So it could be that you associate their name with uh, a particular thing. So it could be uh, if their name is, is um, gatehouse that you think, okay, so when I'm thinking of that person, I think of a gate and you visualize the gate and then you visualize a house. So you could do so th those, that sort of word association. Another way is word association, but thinking about, okay, I was at this event and I was talking about such and such and I met Joe. And so you, you, you work through it that way and, and you, there's a sort of a pathway to remembering that. So um, uh, another way is, and it's particularly important if the person's name is a tricky one, uh, my name, I, I never thought of my name as, as being particularly tricky, Tamsin, but a lot of people uh, either mishear it as Tasman. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very um, engaged C, yes. Uh, but also, uh, it's, 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 a, it's just a bit of an unusual name. So one way that people can actually use that to help remember is actually by thinking, okay, Tamsin. That, that she, she, she said her name wasn't Tasman. So if I see her again, I'll think, okay, her name's not Tasman, it's Tamsin. So clarifying s s unusual names can, um, can be helpful as well. So those are all uh, techniques that you could utilize, um, uh, or you could just be like me and be really embarrassed <coughs> and say, look, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Um, but, or, or bluff it, and sometimes you can do that too. But remembering names is another way of building rapport. Even sort of like name tags are tricky things because you've got to be careful about where your gaze is, of course. Um, <laughs> but if you can sort of like just have a quick look at the name tag and actually use the name, it makes a difference. And it's something that you can practice at a supermarket. All the checkout um, operators have name tags. So then you can actually practice surreptitiously looking and then actually using their name. And it's interesting how their face often lights up when you actually do use their name. Yep. Um, when did, I don't know whether this is right or wrong, but um, when I forgot the name, I tend to sort of, I just make up one. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you all think about that? Who would yeah. rather be called by the wrong name? Or would you rather they just said, sorry, I've forgotten your name? <laughs> <laughs> Another way to save yourself if you really have forgotten their name is to, to have a, a, a context-establishing conversation. <laughs> Great to see you again. When did we last see each other? Okay, that, that gives me a clue. Oh, we last saw each other at such and such. 
Um, what have you been up to since then? So you can actually, you can through a little bit of questioning, build up, and you may remember their name, you may not, but even if you don't remember their name, you may actually remember, work out enough from that to be able to hold uh, a very good networking conversation without remembering their name, and then desperately go on to um, uh, LinkedIn and search under a variety of ways to see if you can find their name afterwards. So what I'm, I'm now going to do is I'm going to, um, uh, get you to do a little exercise, uh, your elevator pitch is a really, really useful thing to, to, to have in a networking situation, in any sort of networking situation. A useful way to structure it is to think about who you are, what you've done, and what you want. Number three there, the what you want, will vary immensely depending on what the purpose of the interaction is or the context in, in which you're actually meeting the pers person. So y the, what you want, you may have um, a whole variety of different ones. So your elevator pitch is never going to be exactly the same from time to time. You are going to vary it ap appropriate to your purpose. Uh, also in your elevator pitch, you're going to actually be thinking about all the things that I've just talked about. So uh, the building of rapport, the, um, the bodily language and all those mm -hmm. sorts of things. So, so I'm thinking about all those aspects of it when you deliver that elevator pitch. Uh, so you make it um, as engaging as, as possible. So what I'm going to do is, um, is get, I'll, get, I'll give you a minute or so to think about what your elevator pitch is. And you can, you can make the, the, the make up the purpose yourself so you can decide what you want uh, appropriate to this purpose. And I'd like you to deliver the, your elevator pitch to the person next door to you. If, okay, did anyone learn any fascinating facts in that? Yes, I can see some nods already. Uh, would you like to share the fascinating fact? Okay, so go, go from accounting and law to writing books. Yeah, it's not law books or accounting. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Any other fascinating facts from through the room? Okay, any anyone who talked to someone who they thought, oh, I wish I'd talked to this person before because now I actually wanted to get to know this person more. Yes, <laughs> that's a, a loaded question. A couple of nods. A couple of nods there. Yeah. So um. So yeah, so the great thing about uh, your elevator pitch is, like Peter said, you could actually um, you could practice that with the um, the checkout operator, the bank teller, uh, you could you could coffee guy, uh, your dog, uh, your your nearest and dearest, because it is one of these things that the more you actually practice it, the more you refine it, and the better you get at delivering it as well the better you get at incorporating all those other activities. Because if you deliver it to your family uh, or your nearest and dearest, um, they're surely going to be fairly critical of what you say. But they can also give you some really good tips. They can could give you some stuff that might um, uh, make it much, much better. So without further ado, because we need to go from personal uh, networking now onto online networking, I'm going to hand over to Peter. So online networking, it's basically email, you might be in some sort of for, um, forums, obviously social media, so Facebook, um, LinkedIn if it's professional. So there are a lot of different mediums that you can use for online networking. You need to think about what you um, want to achieve. So with any sort of online present, think about your aim. If you're sending an email to someone, what's the purpose of the email? If you're joining Twitter or joining LinkedIn, why are you joining those um, those social media networks? What is actually best for the purpose? So, sort of Facebook, is that the best place um, to build professional networks? Or is LinkedIn a better place? Is Twitter? Finding <laughs> news, getting news and information. Maybe it's Twitter would be better. So think about what you're actually trying to achieve, what media would be best. And then think about it, sort of split it up between professional and personal. So a lot of us, when we sort of like first got onto Facebook, you know, you basically it was a numbers game and you let anyone join and they were all your friends. So suddenly you had, were friends with people that you wouldn't recognise if you walked past them on the street. 
So at some point, a lot of us started thinking about whether that was appropriate or not. Um, a, standard a standing joke is that at Christmas time, I have a look at my Facebook list and I think about, would I want to tell you something personal? Would I recognize you as I was walking down the street? And if the answer was no and no, Merry Christmas, delete. Merry Christmas, <laughs> delete. <laughs> Facebook is really shrinking for me, <laughs> but LinkedIn is growing. Um, so think about sort of, yeah, will they be the same? Um, also, do you have time to do it well? So social media in particular looks very sad if it's sitting there neglected, unloved. You're not actually updating it. It's nothing sadder, really. Think about the benefits and the risks. And also, too, from a work perspective, if your job is going online, so say it's using LinkedIn and making connections, make very sure that you know who owns those connections. If it's part of your job, it's quite possible that your employer might own them, not you. If you're doing them work time, part of your job, you leave, you could lose all of those connections. So just be very clear about that as well. Who owns them? So that's the plan side of things. The whole thing about online, whether it's email or whether it's um, social media, whether it's some sort of forum, is about promoting your personal brand. Um, so we do a whole workshop on branding. We also do a whole workshop on two workshops on LinkedIn. So I'm summarizing three workshops in three slides. <laughs> Yay me. Um, but it's also being active, it's participating. So if you join a network, it is a really good idea to participate. And participation can take the sort of shape of, you know, it might be sharing articles. It could just be liking someone's post. Uh, it could be coming up with a discussion. You can be as active or as little as you want, but being a bit active is a really good idea. Then again, there's don't overdo it. So you don't want to start spamming and be that person who is always posting and you sort of look and think, do they actually have a job? <laughs> What's with this? Um, think about whether the brand's appropriate for the channel. So I sort of mentioned LinkedIn, I mentioned Facebook, I mentioned Twitter, there's Instagram. So for Facebook, for me, it's friends and family. LinkedIn is very definitely professional, and if friends and family um, want to connect with me, I very gently sort of say, ah, sorry, it's professional. <laughs> um, and then also Twitter. Every so often I think I've just got to get up, give up Twitter. But I stick with it because my audience on Twitter is actually academics. There's some really interesting information that academics come out with that I'm interested in. So I've got different audiences. Friends, family, professional, academics. So then you think about your audience, you think about the brand that you're promoting to them. It's like those clothes. Um, Twitter, more casually dressed. LinkedIn, you're wearing a tie. So it's the same sort of thing. So think about that as well. So I've talked a lot about LinkedIn. So before I came up, I just had a quick look at some numbers for you. So it was founded in 2003, and apparently there's 500 million users on LinkedIn. So it's not as big as Facebook. But there are two new members per second. And if you just want to look at University of Auckland on its own, there's 124,350 plus. They say it's alumni, it's sort of, it's alumni, but it's also some current students as well, because Tamsin and I just keep making them sign up on LinkedIn, <laughs> so that's us. Um, if you connect with someone on LinkedIn, so from a networking perspective, so say tonight, so you go back, you go and connect with someone, don't just sort of send the connection request, the standard automated one. There's an option to add a note. So add the note and tell them where you've met them. So I met you at the careers evening. Um, just some sort of context. Or if you've never met them, but you want to connect with them because you really like the type of role they're doing or the organisation they work for, or maybe it's just that they also went to the University of Auckland. And you can find out all that stuff on LinkedIn. So just let them know why you want to connect with them, how you might have met them. It increases the chances that they will just automatically go, accept, it's done. But when I get a request, and Tamsin's the same, mm -hmm. if we don't know who the person is, we delay it because we've got to go and look at their profile. So we wait for later, and later might not ever come. 
Um, so if you want to make that connection, really good to give them some context. Also too, this, um, some fun facts, under fun facts, there's 5.5 million accountants on LinkedIn. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was interesting. And the average CEO has 930 connections. Um, it is a really interesting place. So you could sort of like have a look at University of Auckland alumni. You can figure out um, how many of them work in Auckland or in Dubai or wherever it is. You can figure out where they work and what their role is as well. So there's a lot of research and a lot of connections that you can make through that forum. One tip. Apparently, the word motivated in 2014 and 2015 was the most overused word in LinkedIn. So when you're doing your profile, just have a look and see if you've used that word and maybe just take it out. Okay. So there it's got, you know, basically it's getting noticed. So it's just like Facebook, but it's, they call it Facebook with a tie. So it's posting, it's taking um, part in the um, forums. If you don't want to do any of that, use it for research and making those connections. It's one of the best ways. It's getting better and better from that perspective. <coughs> so that pretty much brings us to the end this evening. So think of networking as connecting and having conversations. It's a conversation, whether it's in person or whether it's online. Identify what you want to achieve, so have some sort of purpose. Ensure that you give a great first impression. It's the handshake, it's your body language. It's eye contact, building rapport, watching your personal distances. <laughs> um, being organised, so develop your elevator pitch. You have a different one for different situations, different purposes. Update your social media and keep it updated regularly. Work out how you're going to manage your networks. If you're, so going back to sort of what I said about that first impression, if it's online, think about the words and images you use online to promote your brand. Network with existing contacts, attend events, join professional associations, extend your network as much as you can, just a little bit outside your comfort zone, and then over time your comfort zone will get a little bit bigger, so you're extending it. And then form genuine relationships, and also that final point, nurture those relationships. Thank you for coming this evening. I think we might almost be on time. Has anyone got any questions? Awesome. Thank you.